Dr. Elmore is a professor of general internal medicine here at the UW School of Medicine. She's also an adjunct professor in the Department of Epidemiology in the School of Public Health. She's the section head of general internal medicine at Harborview, and she obtained her MD degree from Stanford University School of Medicine. She did residency training in internal medicine at Yale, and it then had advanced training in epidemiology from the Yale School of Epidemiology and Public Health. She has a number of clinical and scientific interests. Uh, the one you'll be hearing about tonight is accurate, accuracy of cancer screening and diagnostic testing. She's also co-authored a textbook on epidemiology, biostatistics, and preventive medicine. And she enjoys seeing patients as a primary care internist and teaching clinical medicine to students and residents. We would like to cure breast cancer. In fact, we really want to prevent breast cancer from ever being diagnosed. Unfortunately, our goals have not quite caught up, or our science has not quite caught up with these goals. Until science does catch up with these goals, our best defense is screening, and screening with mammography. Catch it while it's small. Catch it while we have an easy, treatment available for the woman. The topic of breast cancer screening is surprisingly complex. I'm going to review the good news about breast cancer screening. And I want to talk about our efforts to save lives. But then I'm going to move into what may be new territory, which is the potential harms and some unexpected findings. As a clinician, I am frequently asked by patients should I be screened for breast cancer? In the United States, more than 53 million women should be asking this question every year. For the men in the audience, you should also be asking yourself about other types of screening. The comments I'll make about unexpected findings and potential harms of breast cancer screening, they're applicable to prostate cancer screening. I'll be talking about the good news about mammography, as well as some of the bad and unexpected. And then I want to talk about alternatives beyond mammography. I'll then move into a discussion of the guidelines that we clinicians have that are sometimes vague and um, they don't always agree. And then I want to summarize with communication and how to explain all of the benefits and risks. It's always a pleasure starting with the good, and this is the good. Middle-aged women who have mammography regularly, they reduce their chance of dying from breast cancer by about a third. This shows the actual reduction in mortality, and I find this figure very impressive. This shows the data for the United States. On the far left is the mortality rate in 1950, and then you see a decline starting around 1990. And this data goes up till 2002, but we've continued to see a drop in the mortality rate. And I want to emphasize this before I move on to the next topic, which is the potential harms of screening. Much of that mortality reduction we think is due to screening, and that's the good news. In addition, some of this mortality reduction is due to the wonderful improvements in treatment for breast cancer. Now, in discussing the bad and unexpected, I'll start by explaining what the actual exam is like. A woman comes in, and her breasts are um, put between two plates, and compression is applied. This woman is smiling. <laughs> Point taken. Um, the compression is important. It reduces the motion artifact. It improves the quality of the image, and it also reduces the amount of radiation exposure. The actual images themselves look like this. I've shown two patients mammograms, and you can see how different they are. We often say in clinical medicine, no two patients are alike. I think that is visible here. The patient on the left, patient number one, has very fatty, breast tissue. Patient number two on the right has extremely dense breast tissue. 
And dense tissue is often seen in younger women or women who are on hormone replacement therapy. You can just imagine trying to find a cancer in that dense tissue. And I'll say at this point, I'm an internist, and I admire radiologists. Um, I feel that interpreting these is very challenging. It's always best to hear from the patient what the experience is like. I can show you pictures, but I've actually invited a patient to come up and share with you her recent mammography experience. So, Allie, you want to come up, please? Now, I'm just going to turn things over to Allie to describe it. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll be brief because I know that you're here to hear the experts, not me. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm in my 40s now, and like most people, I'm pretty fearful of cancer. Uh, so when um, you, know, you hear all the stories and the statistics that we've all heard, and we have some family members that um, have had some brushes with cancer and some extended family members and in-laws that have lost battles to cancer, um, and some very close friends that are uh, exactly my age that have fought breast cancer. So when my doctor um, reminded me this summer at my annual checkup that it was time for a mammogram, I uh, made the phone call and I made the appointment and um, I unfortunately had to cancel that appointment. Something came up and uh, I then made another appointment um, and had to cancel that as well. I uh, promised myself that before the end of the year, 2007, I would have my mammogram and I had a third appointment uh, for the week before we all split up for the uh, Christmas break. And, um, and so I did, I did manage to, to get in uh, right before um, heading off on a holiday with my family. Uh, so I, you know, the, the mammogram, the good news is that the appointment itself is not very long. Um, it's, you know, not at all pleasant. And for me, you know, it, it hurts a little bit and it's incredibly uncomfortable. Um, I'm lucky in that I've breastfed four children, so the, you know, kind of manhandling, uh, weird clinical setup was, not too shocking for me, so I, that was all right. Um, <laughs> but the best news was I got it done, and I felt very proud of myself, and I ticked it off my to-do list for 07 and thought I don't have to deal with that till somewhere <laughs> very the end of 08, um, and, I, and I went on my merry way. Um, I had a wonderful Christmas with my family, and on December 26th, um, I got a phone call. Uh, it was the first break I'd taken from my kids and, and my husband. I was going to go skate ski for an hour. And um, literally, as I was taking skates, the, my skis out of the car, the phone rang, my cell phone rang, and I answered it. Um, and a voice just said, um, calling uh, regarding your recent mammogram. Um, the radiologist has found a focal density in your left breast, and uh, we need to see your previous films immediately, or you need to come in for additional testing but we can't track down your films. Um, so I asked a couple of questions, but I realized that the person calling didn't have um, the type of information I wanted, like, do I have breast cancer? Um, so I, I just simply asked what I could do to help, and she said, track down your films, which I did do instead of skiing. I called around and found out that they had been sent, but to the wrong uh, place. So uh, I then called this woman back and said, I've done that. Is there anything I should do? And she said, no, that's it. Um, so I didn't ski that day. Uh, I was shell-shocked. You know, I, um, I am kind of dramatic by nature, but it did not go unnoticed to me that it was 10 hours after Christmas, and I was getting this phone call, and I thought, well, that must mean it's serious, because why would they call you 10 hours after Christmas? It, they would wait till the New Year, um, <laughs> if it's not that important. Um, and I thought, you know, it's a sunny, beautiful day. It's the first break I've taken from my kids, you know, and your head plays all these games, and you're thinking, I guess my 2008 will be war with cancer. I can, you know, you talk yourself into this thing, and now I think, gosh, I tell anybody, you know, you go racing home, think I'll never go skiing away from my kids again. I'm just going to stay right here um, forever. Um, I decided I would tell my husband. I told my husband I got the strange call, and it looks like there's something funky with my left breast, and he just kind of went quiet, um, which I found out after the fact was more because he was completely and utterly freaked out, uh, but thought, well, if I play it down, she'll think it's just not a big deal. So he and I were both kind of silent and awkward and just thought, well, it must be nothing, but it must be something, because why else would they have called 10 hours after Christmas? Um, so uh, I lived with that for about 10 days, and, um, and it was freaky. I, 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 you know, you go on your merry way, but it, it's just a haunting thing. Um, and it was there, uh, kind of haunting me day in and day out. And I got a phone call 10 days later 
uh, in which um, somebody kindly told me that um, the radiologist had looked at my previous films and the density, which at this point I had translated into tumor, because density, it sounds like a mass, a mass is a tumor, and tumor is cancer, and so that was my self-diagnosis. So but they said, it looks like that density, the lesion, whatever it was, it's stabilized over a period of time, so just come back in in a year and, and we'll, we'll keep our eye on it. So I was released of all that. It was an amazing you know, moment where you feel like you have a second chance at living, and um, I was very grateful for that. Um, that, was, that was a wonderful call. <laughs> I want to show her mammograms. This is the right and left image. Every time you have a screening exam, two views are taken of each breast. Now something was noticed in the left breast. On this view, this is called medial lateral oblique, and this white shadow up at the top, that's the axillary fold. This view, again I'm showing the right and the left breast. This one's called a CC view, or a cranial caudal view, going from top down. And again, they saw something in the left breast. I've circled it to help everyone. And I want to show it to you on both views. Now, it seems to me that there's a few lessons learned. And so that's what I wanted to ask Allie to finish up with, which is, um, well, <laughs> I also have to add, there's something that's kind of ironic about this. Um, <laughs> For my third mammogram, which I was determined not to cancel, I did realize about four days beforehand that I had a conflict. I was due to work at one of my kids' schools. And so I panicked, and I thought, I've got to get cover for this, because I've got to go to this mammogram, or it will be 08. Um, so I called the one other parent that I'd heard that can off sometimes cover this library shift, and it was Dr. Elmore. So I called Dr. Elmore. I didn't even know she was Dr. Elmore. I just knew she was Joanne. And I said, gosh, I was wondering if you could cover this one hour library duty. And she said, no, I have a meeting that day. I can't do it. And I said, oh, gosh, sorry. You know, I just, I have a mammogram. And um, I really don't want to cancel it. And she said, well, you shouldn't cancel it. You should go to your mammogram and, um, you know, do try to get somebody to cover your shift. And by the way, Allie, um, if you get called back, um, you know, don't panic. It's part of the screening process. It happens more often than people realize. So I filed that information away in my head. Um, and it was really useful for those two weeks because I can't, I mean, if I had not had that backdrop of knowledge, I, I was pretty traumatized regardless. I, I would have been a mess. And so for me, the lesson learned and what I've been doing, telling family members and friends and anybody I come in contact with, that when you get your mammogram, just make sure you know that it's, it's not unusual to be called back or for there to be a request for some additional testing and that that's not the time to panic. You know, maybe panic when you're told there is absolutely a problem, but not before then. Right. And also, maybe get your mammograms at the same place, if possible, because I think that if they hadn't had to track down the films, I probably wouldn't have, uh, maybe not had a call. Right. I don't know. So, so. two important lessons. Yeah. Go to the same facility every year. Seeing stability of lesions is very reassuring to the radiologist. If you want to change facilities, try and get your old mammograms available, made available to the radiologist. And then secondly, knowledge mm -hmm. is helpful. Thank you again, Allie. Thank you. Just as our patient shared her experience, I want to share my own clinical experience. When I was in training um, at Yale in internal medicine, I wanted to learn more about all of the x-rays we were taking. And, and so I took a mammogram and brought it to a radiologist and asked her if she could help show me how they're interpreted. And she showed me a little abnormality and she asked me what the biopsy showed. And I said, you know, I just saw this patient in clinic. She was told the mammogram was normal. And so I was getting a different interpretation on a mammogram. I found that very scary. And so I did what most people would probably do, which is I got a third opinion. And the third opinion was a little bit different from the first and second. And so I begin to wonder, do radiologists vary in their interpretation of mammograms? I know that when I'm listening to a heart murmur with a group of students, we hear many different things. And there really is an art to medicine. And so I wanted to find out, is this really a problem? 
and I was early in my career just learning how to do research, and I invited a group of local radiologists to participate in a clinical study. We got 10 of them, and they kindly agreed to interpret 150 mammograms on two separate occasions, and I had them interpret the mammograms independently. They had no idea what the other's interpretations were. I want to show you their interpretation on just one exam. This shows the patient's mammogram, the right and left exam. I've added an arrow here, and the arrow shows a subtle abnormality that some of the 10 radiologists noted, not all of them, but some. When they looked at these films, they did not have the arrow on it. I've added it for your benefit today. And this shows the second view. And again, on the right side, there's an arrow that I've placed, but when the radiologist reviewed these exams, they didn't have the arrow. Let me show you the 10 radiologist interpretations. On the top, I show their interpretations and the number of radiologists with each interpretation. Three of the radiologists called the film normal. Two of them said it's benign. Four of them called that film indeterminate. And you could say that's what Ali's was. It was an indeterminate reading. Additional testing is needed. One of these individuals felt that this was very suggestive of cancer. Now remember, they're all reading the same film. When I looked at their recommendations, three of them recommended routine follow-up. Five of them said, well, get an additional mammographic view, maybe a magnification or a cone down. And two of them even went on to say, I would recommend a biopsy. Now, in this study, we obviously had a lot of rich data. And there was a lot of fairly complex statistical analyses. And I always like to look at data in a simple way. And so I thought, let me add up how often a real major clinical difference is noted between two radiologists. And I kind of thought just basically, let me define a major clinical disagreement. I thought if one reading is that it's totally normal, get routine follow-up in a year, and a second radiologist said, let's get a biopsy. To me, that's a pretty major disagreement. This happened in 25% of the exams. Now, I love doing research. And one of the reasons I do is that I'm always learning things. And I'm always learning from looking closer at the data. I realized that I was in error when I was analyzing the data. I was making assumptions. And you always need to be open-minded when you're looking at data. The assumption I was making was that if they were recommending a biopsy, they were recommending it in the same breast. So I thought, gee, let me look at that. And I counted up how often one radiologist recommends a biopsy in the left and another recommends a biopsy in the right in the same patient. And among the women that had two or more uh, radiologists recommending a biopsy, this happened in 9% of the cases. Now, with this much variability, you can imagine that a lot of women are getting called back for additional testing, such as you have heard. So I want to turn to my first audience response. And so get your clickers available. And here is the question. How common are false positive mammograms? Now, I could just say how common just on one exam, but I would like to ask after a decade of annual screening. Because if you start in your 40s, you're going to get 10 in your 40s, 10 exams in your 50s, 10 exams in your 60s. So let's just say how often what is a woman's chance of having at least one false positive mammogram after a decade of annual screening? Is it 2%, 7%, 20%, or 50%? So enter your, your guesses. All right. I can see you guys are looking ahead on the slides, a few of you. <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> All right, so quite a few of you, 44% uh, guessed 20%, and 43% guessed 50%. I'm going to go over the results of a study that I did 
where we quantified this to see how often it really is that a woman has a false positive exam. And indeed, the answer is 50%. What we did was we, we found a very nice health plan. We used one associated with Harvard. We gathered information over a 10-year period on over 2,000 women. We identified these women in a random stratified way. And we counted up how often women would have a false positive exam. Now, I should define a false positive exam. It's basically one in which a woman is called back for additional testing. She can be called back for additional mammogram or an ultrasound or even a biopsy. And this woman, after a whole year of follow-up, she does not have breast cancer. This is the results of our study. I show here, going from the left, a woman's chance in this very high quality health plan of having one false positive mammogram. And then on the far right, what is her chance after 10 exams? Now this is her chance of having had at least one false positive mammogram. And you can see that it gets up to 50%. Now, not all of these women go on to have biopsies. But in our study, 20% of them, 2 out of 10, also had a biopsy. With this many women being called back for additional testing, you can ask, we're finding more and more things. Are we getting an epidemic of diagnoses? Now, this is challenging territory to cover. So let me step back and explain two different types of cancer. On the left, I show a very oversimplified picture of a non-invasive cancer. This is called ductal carcinoma in situ, or DCIS. Then on the right, I show invasive cancer. And you'll notice those little yellow cells. They're inside the ducts on the left. And on the right, they're invading outside of the milk ducts. On the right, it's invasive. This is the one that has potential to kill. Now, we have a challenge here in that we don't know which women that have the in situ will go on to have the invasive. Some will, but not all. We also have a challenge in that we're seeing a lot more of this DCIS, this ductal carcinoma in situ. Let me show you the data. This is for the United States. This shows the number of cases of DCIS in the US from the 1970s to 2000. Now, does this look like the rate is going up? Yes. We started mammography screening in the mid-80s, and it really took off. And now the majority of women are getting screened. Now, you might ask, well, this doesn't prove anything. Let me show you the same data stratified by age groups of women, because we do not recommend screening for women in the 30s. So you would assume that they would not have a rise. On this slide, I show you the, the incidence rates of this in situ, this DCIS cancer, going from the 1970s to the 1990s. And you'll see this flat line on the bottom with the triangles. This is the data for women in the 30s who are not getting screening with mammography. It's been stable over time. Now, the dark squares are of women in the 40s. Now, not as many women in the 40s get screened. Um, some want to put it off. There's been a lot of controversy back and forth uh, over whether women should be screened in the 40s. And so the screening rates are not as high. The highest line here is of the open circles. And this is for women above the age of 50. We are diagnosing an awful lot of this DCIS, this non-invasive cancer. Well, let me show you now on the next two slides why this is important to me. First of all, the majority of women with this DCIS, they survive at the same rate as women that don't have any cancer at all. You take 100,000 women with this DCIS, compare them to women without, same mortality rates. Secondly, they have done autopsy studies of women that have died, for example, women that die in a car accident. These women did not know they had any breast cancer at all. They did fine cuts through their breast tissue, and they found an awful lot of this DCIS. In fact, they found it between 2 and 16% of women. Now, our challenge here is that we can't identify which women 
with DCIS are going to transform into the invasive cancer which has the potential to really harm the women. The next slide shows you the treatment that women with DCIS in the United States are receiving. And before I show it to you, remember that DCIS is, is non-invasive. About two-thirds of the women with DCIS would never go on to have invasive cancer. I show you in the two figures on the left, I show the data for the treatment that is received for women with DCIS. And on the right, I show the data for the women that have stage one, which is invasive breast cancer. And then I show the percentage receiving each of these three types of treatment. On the top is lumpectomy only. In the yellow, lumpectomy with radiation. And then in the bottom, mastectomy. They're pretty similar. About 30% of women with this DCIS are having mastectomies. This is major surgery, as you can, um, I think, well understand. I've talked about potential overdiagnosis with DCIS. I've talked about the very high rates of false positives. And I've talked about variability in the interpretation of mammograms. I now want to move beyond mammography and say, can we improve it or can we do some other sort of screening test? And I have three examples for you. First is, why not? add a computer. Develop a computer program to interpret the mammogram. You can develop algorithms, and they can place a mark on the image that would then help the radiologist in their interpretation. These have been developed, and they are in common usage now. This is an example of what the uh, computer marking would look like. Now, these are called computer-aided detection programs. They were, they were first approved by the FDA in 1998, and then Medicare started approval for funding of them in 2001. And they've really been, they've, it's really taken off in the community. And it is estimated that in the last year or two, 40 to 50 percent of all mammograms in the United States have the application of a computer-aided detection program. A um, few months ago, I actually did a, a survey of the Seattle area, and I went to DEX online telephone directory, and I called up the 17 mammography facilities that were listed, and it, I f asked them, do you have this computer program? 16 of the 17 had the program, and the 17th was going to buy it this year. Well, I studied the effect of this computer-aided detection program. And I did this within facilities in a couple of states in the United States. And I want to show you the impact of this computer-aided detection, this CAD program, on the performance. Because this was unexpected. We looked at the facilities before and after the application, before and after they purchased the computer program. And this is what we found. The recall rate increased. This is the percentage of women that they're calling back for additional testing it went from 10% to 13%. And I show a p-value here. This means that this was statistically significant. So the computer is finding more abnormalities, and the radiologists are calling more women back. We looked at the biopsies that were recommended, and they also increased after the application of the computer programs. They increased from 15% to 18%. This was a significant, a statistically significant increase. Now, it would be fine to call more women back if you were detecting more cancers. And here's the unexpected. We looked at sensitivity, which is basically the percent of women that really do have cancer, that have a positive test. And we found that it went up a little bit from 80 to 84 percent, but it was not statistically significant. That's what this NS means. And in the manuscript that was published, we performed quite a few other additional analyses. And when we combined the overall performance, it was lower at the facilities that used the computers, significantly lower. 
my fear is that radiologists may be falsely reassured. We noticed that they were missing the invasive cancers, the really large masses, and that after the application of the computer, they were picking up more of the DCIS, the little calcifications. So this was very concerning to us. Um, the FDA is currently evaluating the use of these. It's already been approved, and so we're not quite certain what is going to happen. It's very hard to evaluate technology once it has gotten loose in the community. I still have patients ask me whether they should pay the extra 40 to $50 to have the application of a computer. And the answer, we really don't know. But in this study, we found that it actually lowered the accuracy. So that's it for mammography. Let me now move on to another test. Everyone always wonders about MRI scans. And so let me show you them, because they are beautiful. This is a woman who had a normal mammogram. She went in to get an MRI scan, and this is what it looked like. I think you can all notice this very large mass. Very visible. The problem is, MRI scans are not recommended for the general population. They have never been studied in the general population for screening. They have only been studied in very high-risk groups. They have been studied in women that have breast cancer. And they've been studied in women that have the genetic mutation for breast cancer, the BRCA1 and 2. They are not recommended for the average population. MRI scans require an IV injection of contrast. Many women are claustrophobic. It's in a very tight little machine. They cost a few thousand dollars. They require expertise to interpret. And they pick up every little abnormality. So it's unknown what the false positive rate would be with MRI scans. So again, MRI scans, they're not ready for prime time screening of the everyone in the US. Well, let's move from high tech to low tech. What about the examination that the physician does? And so this is another audience response question. I want to ask you, how much time do you think is required for a physician to perform a high quality breast exam? And I see everyone looking at the answer, so please don't look. 30 seconds, one minute, five minutes, or 10 minutes? How much time does your doctor really spend? Could be another question. Well, 28% of you looked ahead at the next slide. <laughs> and 13% of you said 30 seconds. If you were to actually time the physicians in the community, I suspect most spend less than 30 seconds. In addition, they've done um, hidden cameras in exam rooms and have looked at the quality of exams and you would think the doctors would have a nice organized search pattern. It was random in about half of the exams. I think we have uh, a lot of room for improvement here, but 10 minutes is the correct answer. The reason why it's correct is that the one main clinical trial of breast examination was done in Canada. They trained nurses, and they spent 10 minutes. This is five minutes on one breast, five minutes on the other breast. I think some women would kind of wonder what the doctor is doing after about <laughs> three to four minutes. But indeed, in this clinical study, women came in annually and had a 10-minute exam. There are benefits, I think, though, to the breast examination in that I can teach my patients to feel more comfortable evaluating their own breasts. It's surprising, but about half of the breast cancers detected are not detected by mammography. Women pick them up, or physicians pick them up in their annual screening exam. I've gone over a couple of different types of screenings, and now I want to move to guidelines. And I want to show you guidelines for the clinical breast examination, which we just discussed, 
I'll show two national groups. I'm going to show the American Cancer Society on top, and then the US Preventive Services Task Force. You'll notice that they don't agree. The American Cancer Society is invested in really stamping out breast cancer and any cancer. They recommend starting with a physician examining your breast at age 20. The US Preventive Services Task Force, which is evidence-based and has reviewed the literature on this, feels that there's insufficient evidence. Well, what about mammography? Here I show three different groups, the American Cancer Society, the US Preventive Services Task Force, and I've added an NIH consensus panel. You'll notice above the age of 50, the, everyone's in agreement, so that's easy for the clinicians. We know the guidelines say yes, so we tell everyone you should get it annually. Now, I'm going to show you what they recommend for women in the 40s, and you'll see a little bit of variability here. The American Cancer Society says yes. The US Preventive Services Task Force, they have changed their recommendations over the last decade. It used to be a no, and now it's a yes, but it's a yes in that we should make certain that there's informed decision making, and they want us to point out to the women in the 40s that the absolute benefit is less. The reason being is that breast cancer is more common when you get older, and there are some risks associated with screening, such as false positive exams. Now, at the bottom, I list this NIH consensus panel. Now, this was a panel that was convened 10 years ago by the National Cancer Institute. They felt at that time that all of these large randomized clinical trials had been completed and had some new data, and they wanted to have an expert panel review the literature. They selected individuals that were scientists, that were clinicians. They made certain that none of these individuals uh, was biased. They did not have a vested interest in mammography. This group reviewed thousands of articles. They held a three-day conference where they invited in the experts to give even up-to-date data. Let me share with you their overall summary. They said that the data currently available do not warrant a universal recommendation for mammography for all women in their 40s. Each woman should decide for herself whether to undergo mammography. Now, the reaction to this consensus panel was rapid and harsh. <laughs> Dr. Copans is head of breast imaging at Harvard, and he called the group fraudulent. <laughs> Dr. Klausner, who was the physician who was the head of the National Cancer Institute, who convened the group, said that he was shocked by the results. Dr. Healy said that this challenges the ethos of early detection. Now, within 36 hours, the US Senate voted on this also, and they voted 98 to 0 in favor of screening. I doubt they had enough time to read the thousands of articles. Let me show you the data. Because everyone in making these guidelines is using the same information. All of the trials are done. I want to begin by going over again what a randomized clinical trial is. This shows healthy women are asked, will you participate in a randomized clinical trial? Some of them are randomized to mammography. The others go to control group. They don't get any screening. And the X's show their annual mammograms. This can last many years. Then, once the study is done, you may need another 10 to 15 years of follow-up to assess the number of breast cancer deaths. That's your outcome of interest. These studies take hundreds of thousands of women. In fact, to date, we've had over, over half a million women have been studied in multiple trials. I doubt we would be able to repeat this nowadays. I don't think any woman would want to be randomized to the control group. And the fact that it takes so many years of follow-up, 10 to 15 years, to see whether the women that were randomized to mammography versus the women in the control group to look at the, the deaths, in 10 to 15 years, we may have a new technology, or I'm hoping we'll have a cure. So these are challenging to study. Let me show you the data. I'm going to walk you through this slide. On the left, I list the name and in parentheses the year of each of the main randomized clinical trials. Associated with each of these names is a dot and a line. 
The dot is the overall result of that study. This line is the 95% confidence interval. Now, you'll notice I put a yellow line here. The yellow line represents a relative risk of one. All of the dots are to the left of the yellow line. That's good. That's what we wanted. That means that the women randomized to mammography had less breast cancer deaths in these studies. That's great. In addition, a couple of these studies, two of them, the, the lines do not cross the yellow relative risk of one. They reach statistical significance. Remember this figure, because this is only the data for women 50 to 74 years of age. I'm now going to show you the data from the same clinical trials, but for women in the 40s. It's obvious that there are a few differences here. First of all, some of those dots are to the right of the yellow line. That's not what we wanted to find. In those studies, women randomized to mammography had higher breast cancer deaths compared to the control groups. But you'll also notice that a lot of these lines are really long, and they all cross one. It's very hard to do a study of mammography for women in the 40s because breast cancer is not as common in younger women. Again, everyone is looking at the same data, and they're coming up with their guidelines. My concern is that perhaps they're looking at the data in different ways. So let me ask this group. Which screening program would you support? And I'll ask you to use your audience response again. And I've listed three different types of screening programs. A reduces the death rate by 34%. B produces an absolute reduction in deaths from breast cancer of 0.06%. And C prevents one death for every 1,588 women screened over 10 years. So which screening program sounds the best to this group? Seventy-four percent said A. Doesn't surprise me. I think A sounds good, too. Um, Thirty-four percent reduction, that's a lot. Well, what I have to tell you is that a, B, and C are all from one study. It's just a different way of saying what the data shows. There was a big, wonderful clinical trial published in, that was done in Sweden and subsequently published. And you can describe the results of this clinical trial as a relative risk reduction. In this trial, it reduces the death rate by 34% compared with controls. Or you can read the paper and say, this, this study found that it produces an absolute reduction in deaths from breast cancer of 0.06%. That's a risk difference, an absolute difference. Now, C, very few people selected, that shows that this study that was published of mammography, a very good study, it prevented one death for every 1,588 women screened over 10 years. That's the number needed to screen to prevent one death. Now, 10 years, we're talking over 15,000 mammograms to prevent one death. The absolute benefit of screening mammography is less than we had hoped for, especially among women in the 40s. And the benefit for individual women is really hard to interpret. It's when you get the population level that you see something that you can describe as a 34% reduction. I've talked about guidelines and how they vary and how complicated it is to explain statistics. How do we work with our patients and communicate the risks and benefits of all of this screening? I saw this picture in a magazine when I was at the grocery store. I got in the, long, in the wrong line and it was too long and so I was looking through the magazines. And I was interested in this article. It was two pages. And it asks, confused about mammograms, when should you have one? Can you trust the results? We clear up your questions about breast cancer screening. I wish it was that easy. 
I have a lot of patients that come to me and say, doctor, what's my risk of getting breast cancer? Now, most doctors don't know this off the top of our heads. It's a hard number to come up with. So of course, I'm gonna ask you. What is a 41-year-old woman's risk of breast cancer over the next five years? And I'm adding a little bit more material here to the question. So don't use your clicker yet. This is a woman who her mother had breast cancer. This woman has had one biopsy already. And they did not find cancer, but they found what's called atypical hyperplasia. There were some abnormal looking cells. This woman also was age 40 at the time of her first childbirth. So what is this woman's risk of breast cancer in the next five years? Okay. <laughs> I'm not certain how to interpret this. Um, but <laughs> so one fourth of you think it's less than 4%, uh, one fourth think it's 10%, one fourth think it's 20%, and one fourth think it's 50%. So a 41 year old woman, what is her risk of a breast cancer diagnosis in the next five years? Well, obviously, you're here to learn about this. I love doing research, and I thought I should ask radiologists this question. I asked radiologists who interpret mammograms this question. This is what they do every day. I asked them the exact same question, and I had them write their response. I didn't put them into categories. They could put whatever number they want. The 140 <laughs> radiologists estimated their risk. It went anywhere from, you know, three to four percent to almost a hundred percent. I have no idea what that individual was thinking of. <laughs> we hear this one in eight statistic. I don't know how many have heard this one in eight women in the United States will be diagnosed with breast cancer. Let me comment on that. This is one in eight women will be diagnosed, not die. And this is one in eight women in a lifetime not in the next year or two. And most women are not diagnosed with breast cancer until they're older. The younger cases are often sensationalized in the media. I mean, they just hit you in your heart. A young woman with two children at home diagnosed with breast cancer. I mean, those really grab your attention. So I need to tell you the answer here. What is a 41-year-old woman's risk? You can go to a couple of websites and enter in this information, and there's a calculator. It's called the Gale Risk Calculator. The actual risk is less than 4%, 3.4%. And so I want you to know 96% of the radiologists overestimated the risk. <laughs> I started with this question. Should I have a screening mammogram? And I want to come back to it now. It's a complicated topic, but the answer is yes. We recommend them for women above the age of 40. We do want women to know that the absolute benefit is less than we had hoped for, and we do want to inform them that there are potential risks. We want women to be informed and to make the choices that are right for them. Let me walk you through the final couple of slides. This is a way that I've developed of showing what would happen if I took all of you in this room and sent you down to the mammography center right now. There's a thousand dots. Each dot represents a woman. I send them to the mammography center. About 900 women will get a letter back that says, don't worry, everything looks great, come back in a year. They will have a normal mammographic image. You'll notice on the right, an arrow, and one of those circles is no longer green. This is a woman who, over the course of the next year, will be diagnosed with breast cancer. The mammogram may have missed the breast cancer. This is an important teaching point here. Mammograms are not perfect. Both patients and physicians can be falsely reassured by them. I've added some black dots here. These are the women, 
such as our patient described, that either receive a telephone call or a letter that says an abnormality was noted. Would you please come in for additional testing? I think that the mammography centers have become very careful in how they word these. They try to not cause too much anxiety in the women, but it's still not, women still don't like getting those letters or those calls. Um, they really are hard. Now, on the bottom right, I show two circles. Perhaps two women will be diagnosed with breast cancer out of 1,000. Now, this is just one year's exams. Remember, women are going to come back every year. If a woman starts in her 40s, she could have 30 exams. And remember, over a decade, at least half of these women will have been called back for additional testing. That's just part of a screening process. It's interesting, though, that in the United States, our callback rate, the percentage of women that are called back, is probably three to four times what it is in Europe. I've covered a lot of ground. Um, I've talked about how hard it is to study these screening tests. It takes hundreds of thousands of women and many, many years. And we're still left with uncertainty. And we still have guidelines that vary. The benefits for individual patients are less than we had hoped for. And there are some unexpected risks. Our priority as clinicians and as scientists is to try and help the patients now so that they make informed decisions. I want to end with more of a personal note and tell you that when I was eight years old, I visited my aunt in Texas. And I saw her mastectomy scars, bilateral. She ultimately died of breast cancer. I'm afraid of breast cancer, even though I know my risk is less than 4% in the next five years. But I have hope. I do have hope. My vision for the future is that we're going to continue to improve mammography until the basic scientists can find a cure. We actually have a lot of work still to do, and I think you'll agree with me. Thank you very much, and we'd be happy to answer your questions. With CAD, most radiologists prior to CAD used to do two reads, one radiologist and another radiologist. A lot of the sites now are using CAD as their second read. What do you think the efficacy of that is? The, the question was about mammograms with the application of computers as a second reader. I think the human eye is better. I would trust a second human eye. What about the uh, possibility of using infrared thermography as a diagnostic tool for cancer? It's less evasive, invasive than any other techniques that you're using. They're evaluating quite a few different methods, trying to see if we can come up with something to replace mammography. Infrared, uh, there's another one where they look at electrical potentials, kind of like taking an EKG of the breast. These are better as a diagnostic tool, not as a screening tool. It's hard to evaluate them as a screening tool because it would take 20 years and uh, 500,000 women. They, they are evaluating some other tools, and some women may experience them, but they're only after the women notice a lump or an abnormality is noticed on a mammogram that they then go forward and have additional testing such as that. But really, you would hope that there's something to replace mammography, but there isn't. It's really the best test that we have. You mentioned that the U.S. callback rate is three or four times what it is in Europe, and you left it at that. And so my questions are, why is this so different, and who's right? <laughs> Interesting question. If you were to have a mammography program in Sweden, the callback rate's about 2%. In the United States, it's 10%. This has been looked at. And it would be nice if that higher callback rate caught more cancers. But we haven't found that. So then you might ask, well, why is it so much higher in the United States? 
I think there's a couple of reasons. Number one, medical malpractice. The number one, the number one cause of a medical malpractice allegation in the U.S. is failure to detect breast cancer. Radiologists are afraid of missing something. You know, they really care about women. They want to find everything, and they're afraid of missing anything. Thank you. Thank you.